Johnson's last three years in the Senate were defined by challenges to his leadership. 1959 and 1960 saw the Democrats outnumber Republicans almost two to one in both chambers of Congress, with 64 Senate Democrats to 34 Republicans. Johnson told Edmund Muskie, a Maine Democrat, to not take a position on issues too early and instead to wait until they get to the M's in the roll call. When Johnson sought Muskie's support in blocking the amending of Rule 22, Muskie responded, Well, Senator, I think I'll follow your advice and just wait until they get to the M's. When Johnson refused a request by William Proxmire to appoint him to the Finance Committee, Proxmire believed it was due to his opposition to the oil depletion allowance and delivered a Senate speech attacking Johnson's leadership. Carroll writes, his interest in the 1960 Democratic presidential nomination made it impossible for him to avoid the civil rights issue, but his civil rights enthusiasm of 1957 had noticeably faded, possibly because, much as he needed liberal support to obtain the nomination, Southern support was still the sin quo non, and in 1957, he had pushed Southern senators and Richard Russell as far as they would go. Johnson forced into introducing a civil rights bill after both Senate liberals and the White House introduced bills, devised a bill that Roy Wilkins mocked as a sugar-coated pacifier, which LBJ later allowed to die in the Judiciary Committee. Senate Majority Leader Johnson would retire to his office with his feet, either clad in black shoes or boots, up on his desk as he held a glass of scotch in his hand and dominated conversations recounting the triumphs of the day and the strategy for the next. Carroll describes him at ease, confident, purposeful, assured, barring when the subject turned to his presidential ambitions. Johnson would turn down invitations for events that a candidate, even an unannounced one, would be advised to accept. He gave varying explanations for not being an active candidate, one day telling someone that he would not initially campaign because it was not the best way to get the nomination. Other days, he would say he did not want the nomination, reasoning that the South's power was on Capitol Hill and other occasions would insist he was not running because it was impossible for anyone from the South to win the nomination. Jim Rowe warned Johnson that powerful party leaders were lining up behind announced candidates, and LBJ gave him permission to join with Hubert Humphrey. When the press announced Rowe signing on with Humphrey, Johnson told Tommy Corcoran, Jim betrayed me! He betrayed me! LBJ furthered that he was going to need Jim when he stepped in at the proper time to get the nomination, but now the latter was unavailable. Corcoran attempted to remind him he had told Rose something else, but remembered, you couldn't reason with him. Carroll writes, had it not been for one factor, Lyndon Johnson's strategy, whatever its roots, calculation or fear, might have worked. Johnson did, after all, possess a number of assets the other candidates did not, a solid, substantial block of delegates, the Souths, that would be behind him when the convention started, the support of his senators and of Sam Rayburn, and the fact that each of the other contenders had at least one major liability, Humphrey's extreme liberalism, Symington's lack of national recognition, Stevenson and Kufafer's previous losses, while Kennedy had two, his youth and his Catholicism, made Johnson's belief that none of them would be able to command a majority on early ballots seem, at the beginning of 1958, well-founded. As did his belief that therefore the convention would be deadlocked and thrown into the hands of the big state leaders who would turn to him. But there was the one factor, this great reader of men, this man who thought he could read any man, had read one man wrong. John F. Kennedy first arrived on Capitol Hill in 1947 as a young congressman from Massachusetts. In 1952, Kennedy ran for a Senate seat against Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., overwhelming the latter with his family's organization. When Stevenson threw the vice presidential nomination open at the 1956 Democratic National Convention, Kennedy competed for it, and Carroll explains that despite his lack of accomplishment, his vice presidential aspirations were helped by his star turn as the narrator of the tribute to the Democratic Party on the convention's opening night, and party officials trying to prevent Estes Kufafer from being Stevenson's running mate. Carroll writes, when in January 1957, Another vacancy opened on foreign relations. Joe Kennedy importuned Lyndon Johnson to fill it with his son instead of Kufafer, telling me that if I did, 
he'd never forget the favor for the rest of his life. And Johnson agreed. Later, he would say that he had done so because I kept picturing old Joe Kennedy sitting there with all that power and wealth, feeling indebted to me for the rest of his life. And I sure like that picture. But the real reason was 1960. Although, as it would turn out, Kufafer would not be able to make a serious bid for the 1960 Democratic nomination. In 1957, it seemed that he would be able to. He had, after all, won all those primaries in 1952 and had won some in 1956 before bowing out of the race in Stevenson's favor. And at that time, Johnson regarded him as a serious threat for the nomination. Lyndon Johnson did not regard John Kennedy as a threat. In fact, he felt he might be a useful asset. A Southern presidential candidate, a candidate from Texas, for example, would need a running mate from the Northeast it wouldn't be a bad idea to build one up, particularly one who had a father as powerful as Jack Kennedy's. Kennedy, born on May 29, 1917, always seemed to be falling ill. An undiagnosed illness at age 14 forced him to withdraw from boarding school, while Kennedy spent most of his senior year at Cochette out of hospitals. In 1935, he was sick the entire year, forcing him to withdraw and spent almost two months at Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. Within three years, Kennedy returned to being hospitalized when trying to get rid of an intestinal infection that had plagued him for weeks. His actions during what would become known as PT-109, in which Kennedy felt obligated to put the safety of his crew members above himself, would be told for years. Despite the many differences of Kennedy and Johnson, the two were alike in that both men had driven themselves to the limit of their physical endurance during their initial campaigns for Congress. Carroll writes, Throughout his life, Lyndon Johnson had aimed at only one goal, and in his efforts to advance along the path to that goal, had displayed a determination, a desperation really, that raised the question of what limits he would drive himself to in that quest, and indeed whether there were any limits. Had Johnson read Jack Kennedy more accurately, he might have seen that the same question might have been asked about him, the man Lyndon Johnson was running against, this man he didn't take seriously, not only wanted the same thing he did, but was a man just as determined to get it as he was. When Kennedy encountered Jim Rowe at an airport, the former asked Rowe who the most well-known senator in the United States was. Rowe replied that it was Kufafer and Kennedy agreed, though added that he was the second most well-known due to the half hour on national television where he competed with Kufafer for the vice presidency. Carroll explains that although in hindsight it seems obvious that television would transform American politics, Few politicians recognized this new reality as Kennedy did. The latter, dubbed by Jack Cold as the most telegenic person in public life, began appearing on Sunday interview shows from Washington and was a narrator on two programs on the Mideast crisis. Kennedy also dispelled doubts of his health with the use of photographers to capture him playing golf and touch football. And by the end of 1957, Kennedy had made hundreds of speeches in 47 states. Johnson's dismissal of JFK as a senator who never did a thing is an exaggeration, but the import was not far off, with Kennedy biographer Robert Dalek admitting his Senate career produced no major legislation that contributed substantially to the national well-being. Kennedy's lack of accomplishments were drowned out by his media appearances. In spring 1958, Kennedy had a drink with Joseph Alsop at the columnist's home in Georgetown, where some of Alsop's neighbors opened their windows after seeing Kennedy and began applauding. Lyndon Johnson had never received applause when visiting Georgetown homes in spite of visiting them for almost a quarter century. Carroll explains that by 1959, Johnson knew he had two problems in Texas if he wanted to mount a presidential bid the following year. The first was a Texas law banning anyone from being a candidate for two offices in the same election as Johnson wanted to run for president and his Senate seat consecutively. Johnson made a call to Ed Clark, the state secret boss, passing a special act that preserved the prohibition, except for a candidate nominated for both statewide office and either president or vice president. The other issue was a more difficult one, involving Johnson getting back in contact with a figure he'd rather not have. George Parr, the Duke of Duval, who controlled the Valley and its votes. Although Johnson was confident of a Senate re-election race, Texas had gone Republican in the last two presidential elections, and this was due in part to both Eisenhower's popularity and the state becoming more conservative. Johnson had to make sure Parr still wanted to help him and sought to get involved in Parr's 1957 conviction for mail fraud. Carroll speculates that Johnson may also have been worried that Parr would talk about his involvement in the Texas 1948 Senate election and asked Abe Fortas to take the case without a fee. 
Johnson kept his involvement private without anything in writing and monitored the case closely as 1960 approached. Carroll furthers that Johnson's strategy also involved keeping anyone else from winning the nomination, even if LBJ as a Southerner could not win 761 of the 1,521 delegates. In the event that he secured enough delegates from mostly Western and Southern states, the combination would be enough to deny the nomination to JFK, but this plan also entailed LBJ being able to convince Northern bosses that he would be able to win states outside the South in the general election. Johnson accepted an offer to speak at the May 7th Democratic Victory Dinner to 6,000 Pennsylvania state employees. NAACP's Pennsylvania chapter protested Johnson's invitation, citing him as one of the foremost enemies of civil rights in the Senate. Governor David L. Lawrence introduced Johnson at the event, saying Lyndon Johnson is the man who guided through Congress the programs upon which the Democratic Party rests its case with the people. Carroll writes, his excuse for declining invitations was the press of Senate business. But the Senate adjourned for the year in August. Five months were open before the next session. Although he had accepted invitations for events during these months, again and again he pulled back as the day approached, often at the last minute telling his staffers that he wouldn't go. To make some excuse, often he blamed the staff, saying he had never agreed to go, even though of course he had. In a pattern that became so familiar that his aides grew to dread accepting an invitation since they knew that later, after the invitations had been printed and mailed and all arrangements made, they would probably have to call the event's organizers and tell them the featured speaker wouldn't be there. Jim Rowe saw a man being torn, tortured, almost between his desire for something and his desire not to be seen to be desiring it. Carroll describes equivocation as the order of the year in 1959, writing that Johnson would alternate between telling aides that his health made a presidential campaign impossibility or claiming that he had made a full recovery. Johnson also made the Our Home is Here argument in which he would claim the South's strength was in Capitol Hill and he was therefore not interested in either running for president or being drafted for the position. The next moment he would be explaining how he was tending the store to get the nomination, with Baker remembering Johnson's attitude as, I'm not running, but I'm going to win. Carroll writes, and while Johnson was equivocating in 1959, Jack Kennedy was sending into the field against him, a brother a lot less amiable than Ted, one who, in addition, had had Lyndon Johnson fixated in his sights for a long time. The first meeting between RFK and LBJ occurred in January 1953. RFK was working as an aide to Joseph McCarthy as an appointed assistant counsel for the Senate Investigation Subcommittee. McCarthy greeted Johnson and his aides, George Reading and Horace Busby, and while most of McCarthy's staff rose, RFK sat unmoving with a look described as sort of a glower. Johnson took the hands of McCarthy and his standing staffers, eventually getting to Bobby Kennedy, who had an arm sort of half raised until finally getting up and shaking Johnson's hand without looking him in the eye. Busby asked Johnson what that was all about, and he replied, it's about Roosevelt and his father. Carroll describes the relationship between FDR and Joseph P. Kennedy as having ended in acrimony and bitterness, with Johnson having been present for one particularly vivid scene in 1940. FDR believing Kennedy's trip to the U.S. was to denounce Roosevelt for bringing America closer to war and announce his support for Wendell Wilkie, lured him to Washington with a trick. Kennedy called Roosevelt in Johnson's presence, and Roosevelt told Kennedy that he had been thinking about him before hanging up and telling LBJ that he was going to fire Kennedy. Kennedy made a radio address supporting Roosevelt, and one day after the 1940 election, his resignation was announced. Caro adds that Busby and Reedy believe that Johnson's explanation was only partially correct, Busby remembering that Johnson would always force RFK to shake hands whenever the latter was also there in the morning and that LBJ enjoyed making Bobby uncomfortable. Johnson took every opportunity he had to show his dislike for Robert Kennedy, calling the latter Sonny Boy when crossing him in the Senate corridor. Carroll writes that RFK understood things about running for president that LBJ did not, having learned the lesson during the 1956 convention when he asked Senator McClellan if he could give his brother Arkansas's vote. McClellan replied that senators had no votes and that he would be lucky to be a delegate. Carroll explains that RFK learned what Johnson had not, the insignificance of Sanders in the convention equation. George Reedy remembered that Kennedy organization as extremely effective and that 
Johnson supporters thought they could counter JFK since the latter was testing the old saw that a Catholic could not be president. And we saw no reason why we couldn't test the old saw that a Southerner couldn't be president, especially since this was a Southerner who actually managed to pass the first civil rights bill through the Congress in 82 years. But that LBJ never allowed his backers to fight for him. Johnson continued to insist he was not a candidate, although in spite of this, he would become upset when taken at his word. In December 1959, the Democratic Party turned out a lavish dinner in honor of Eleanor Roosevelt. Johnson was invited to give a short speech at the dinner with attendees including Kennedy, Humphrey, Symington, and Adley Stevenson. Johnson declined attending and instead went to a Kansas Democratic Club fundraiser and a sewing bee in Iowa. James Reston of the New York Times wrote, As usual, these moves by the Democratic majority leader are a mystery to friend and foe alike. Even his enthusiastic supporters cannot make sense out of these decisions. Carroll writes, the target of his fearsome rages had always been men and women at whom they could be directed with impunity, subordinates who had no choice if they wanted to keep their jobs, but to accept his tongue lashings, junior senators who, needing his favor, also had no choice. With men he needed, there was not rage with only humility, deference, with Herman Brown of Brown and Root, or the old Senate bulls whose support was still essential to him. He had always been as obsequious as he was overbearing with others. Now, so intense was the conflict within him that it exploded as well against men he needed, at least once in a way very damaging to his hopes. Johnson met with California Governor Pat Brown, spending the first half hour of the meeting telling the governor why he was unelectable. When Brown agreed with him, however, he responded in a rage that infuriated Brown and made the latter completely unwilling to ever consider endorsing him. JFK sent his brother to meet with Johnson at the latter's ranch, where RFK was knocked to the ground by the recoil of a powerful shotgun Johnson gave him during a deer hunting trip. LBJ remarked, son, you've got to learn to handle a gun like a man. Johnson was so convincing in his claim that he had decided not to run that RFK returned to his brother and told him that LBJ probably was not running. On New Year's Eve 1959, Johnson convened a meeting at his ranch to capture the 10 states key to his plan. Although Reading and Johnson believed Wyoming was a state that bore the LBJ brand, this soon changed after the former arrived at the Cheyenne Airport. One of the reporters following him asked a man who Wyoming would be supporting in the election, the man answering Kennedy and furthering that he was the only one who's been out here and asked us for our vote. The man was Tenno Roncalio, the Wyoming Democratic Party chairman. Wyoming was a state that Lyndon Johnson should have had, and we would have had if we had merely done some organization work in it a few months earlier, Reedy would later say. Making matters worse, civil rights returned. Johnson's assurances to liberals to improve the Civil Rights Act of 1957 had not been followed through with either amendments to redeem it or subsequent bills to redeem it. Although Johnson had secured the support of the South with the Civil Rights Bill so weak that it was virtually no bill at all, the weak bill served as confirmation of long-held suspicions of him. Former chairman of both Americans for Democratic Action and the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, Joseph Al Rowe Jr. called this 1960 Civil Rights Bill a pile of rubbish and garbage, furthering it was a joke. Everybody knew it was a joke. Nobody who was really for civil rights then could have supported it. Ra felt that Johnson was not really for civil rights nor against it, simply being for anything that would help him become president. It wasn't that he was a conservative or a radical or anything else. It was simply that he was trying to be all things to all people. On May 29th, as he spoke before the American Jewish Conference, Executive Secretary of the NAACP, Roy Wilkins praised the civil rights records of Nixon and all the Senate candidates for the presidential nomination, except Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. Johnson was tasked with having to convince blacks and liberals that the 1957 Civil Rights Act was a historic achievement in spite of how watered down it was. Carroll writes that although men and women who watched him in Washington believed he could sell it anywhere, it was nonetheless a difficult sale that no one else could make for him. This was demonstrated in his efforts to let others make his case for him as LBJ stayed in Washington instead of traveling to northern states to make his civil rights stance. Johnson appealed to Hobart Taylor, a young black assistant district attorney, to invite leaders to meet with four of Johnson's Texas surrogates. Following the meeting, one of the leaders told a reporter that although they tried to convince them that Johnson was a friend of blacks and doing his best to help them, they were not convinced that withdrawing their opposition and helping Johnson's campaign would benefit them. 
The Democratic Midwest Conference was attended by three of its four invited speakers, Kennedy, Symington, and Humphrey. Johnson skipped the conference and an aide of his work for hours to persuade key Michigan politicians to support him, but without success. Broder describing the participants as being on the verge of exhaustion and tears. Woods wrote that the more trips Johnson took to the North, the more black people would get to meet him and the better it will be for him. But Johnson's refusal to admit that he was a candidate continued to lead to comedic scenes for some and frustrating ones for his supporters. Campaign headquarters were being set up in the Ambassador Hotel on the corner of 14th and K Streets, with furniture being rented and telephone lines installed. Despite Johnson being the one staffing the campaign, the campaign headquarters was proof that a campaign existed and he wanted secrecy. A story about the headquarters appearing in Sarah McClendon's column and Johnson screaming after seeing it. In March, Israeli Prime Minister David Ben Gurion visited the United States. Edwin Wiesel arranging for LBJ to meet with the Prime Minister, and Johnson backing out as he cited the meeting as making him look like a candidate. Carroll writes, and in fact they were. Journalists, politicians, his own supporters, their puzzlement over his tactics was turning to ridicule, even Charlie Herring, loyalist of the loyal followers of his standard through so many campaigns, was losing faith. We do have a candidate, don't we? He asked Jenkins in the call on March 23rd. He isn't going to run out on us, is he? I wear the chain I forged in life, Marley's ghost admits to Ebenezer Scrooge. I made it link by link. During the early months of 1960, Lyndon Johnson was forging link by link his own chain, and it was a heavy one. Humiliation had always been what he most feared. During these months again and again, through his own actions, he was bringing upon himself what he most feared. Johnson asked Congressman Tip O'Neill if he could come to the latter's office. In speaking with the protege of Majority Leader John McCormick, LBJ told O'Neill, Now, I realize you're pledged to the boy, but you and I both know he can't win. He's just a flash in the pan, and he's got no substance of record to run on. Will you be with me on the second ballot? Although O'Neill insisted that Kennedy would win the nomination due to the innovative methods of his family, their wealth, and the long arm of his father, Johnson insisted that Kennedy would die on the vine and that he was asking for some aid and support afterward. As O'Neill recalled, he just couldn't imagine that Jack Kennedy was going to win. Humphrey winning the West Virginia primary would end Kennedy's chances of winning the nomination, as it would throw control of the party's nominee to the back rooms where LBJ could make arrangements and deals to have it handed to him. The Kennedy campaign enlisted Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr. to campaign for JFK in West Virginia, where he constantly alleged that Humphrey had dodged the draft during World War II, in spite of Humphrey being prevented from joining the Army or Navy due to physical disabilities. It was believed that due to the focus on Kennedy's religion and only 5% of West Virginians being Catholic, that Humphrey would likely win the primary. Days before the West Virginia primary, Kennedy delivered remarks on the importance of the separation of church and state and took over 60% of the vote in the state's primary. The West Virginia victory was seen as solidifying Kennedy's chances of being the Democratic presidential nominee. With W.H. Lawrence writing, The road to victory in Los Angeles suddenly seemed free and clear to him. LBJ attended the press conference the following morning where he could not bring himself to look at the statement prepared for him by George Reedy that read, The West Virginia primary demonstrated that voters are not going to pick a candidate on the basis of an irrelevant issue such as how he worships his God. And when asked about Kennedy's victory, Johnson would either say, I don't know, or I have nothing to say. Sarah McClendon, a reporter who had covered LBJ for years, noted that he slumped further in his seat as he had circles under his eyes and looked sad. Carroll writes, and then, when it was in effect too late, when his dream was all but dead, when his chances for the great prize were all but gone, Lyndon Johnson showed how much he had wanted it all along. By the morning after that sad press conference, he had pulled himself together, and during the two months remaining before the Democratic convention, he made a desperate lunge for the prize. Johnson finally reached out to Jim Rowe for assistance after turning him down for years, the latter no longer having a candidate after Humphrey exited the race. On the Friday after the West Virginia primary, Johnson flew to Indiana, where the primary's delegates were only on the first ballot, and he had been assured by Senator Vance Hart that the delegates would switch to him from Kennedy on the second ballot if he could hold on through the first. On the eve of Memorial Day weekend, Johnson conveyed the Senate at 10 in the morning and held long strategy sessions each evening with his campaign team. Afterward, traveling to the West. 
Carroll writes that Johnson's personality also worked to his advantage in the West, as although LBJ alone and unprotected on a flatbed truck, no paper to hide behind, nothing to look at but the faces of his strangers, Lyndon Johnson, with nothing to rely on but himself, became what Carroll calls a candidate with a remarkable gift for establishing rapport with an audience. Johnson told Western ranchers that they were being cheated by the world of high finance, whose bias against the West was seeing the high interest rates on the financing for development projects needed in the West, and discriminatory freight rates where they sent either cattle or goods to market. Johnson said the West needs a champion in Washington. Theodore White would later write that if Johnson could become the candidate of the West and the South, he could stand as the candidate of the wide open spaces, the candidate of William Jennings Bryan Crescent against the preponderant northern northeastern bloc, and thus have a realistic chance of winning the Democratic nomination. Party leaders and journalists traveling with Johnson over the plane admitted that his trip had improved his position in the presidential sweepstakes in every state. Ted Kennedy would later acknowledge that had LBJ campaigned earlier, he would have locked up the West without any difficulty at all. Carroll wrote, looking at that trip that Lyndon Johnson finally made at the end of May 1960, it is easy to speculate about what he might have cost himself by his years of procrastination. If he had held the West, the convention might well have deadlocked, been thrown into the back rooms from which he was certain he would emerge as the nominee. Carroll writes of the halter and brittle RFK used on Western delegates and that Robert Kennedy was not a man to allow someone who had accepted the halter to take it off. There was an Idaho delegate who, although moved by an LBJ speech, had earlier given his pledge to Bobby Kennedy and noted that the latter was not a man who ever forgave a broken promise. Johnson returned to Washington making calls for hours daily. Through May and June 1960, Johnson also flew to New York, Oklahoma, and Iowa, logging 31,250 miles across the United States, making 36 speeches and holding 26 press conferences. By the end of June, the West was gone. Irv Hoff would later say of LBJ, he had put it off and put it off and put off as long as he could, and he put it off too long. Rowe advised Johnson that while Kennedy now had the nomination, the only way to stop him was to see if Adley Stevenson would be willing to signal that he could be drafted, believing that the votes for Stevenson along with LBJ, Symington, and some favorite sons would be enough to deny Kennedy a first ballot victory. Johnson was also able to wear down Sam Rayburn to get Congress to recess and only completed session on August 8th following the convention. When JFK began running for president, Johnson initially derided Kennedy as the boy, Sonny boy, Johnny, or little Johnny, and a rich kid with a dad trying to buy him the nomination. He publicly was stated by David Broder to look with paternal pride on the accomplishments of Kennedy, Symington, and all the others who flourished so well under his care. His jabs at Kennedy became sharper as the seriousness of the latter's bid became apparent, even calling JFK second class at a press conference and often referred to the next president eating guts after Kennedy mentioned that he would express regrets to Khrushchev. At the end of June, Johnson drafted president of the American power company Donald Cook to investigate JFK, Cook going to Frank Bro, who used his many doctor contacts around the U.S. to discover that Kennedy had been treated for Addison's disease in Boston and was apparently still afflicted by it and receiving treatment for it. Louis Herxtall, the doctor who treated Kennedy, was contacted and told Arthur Perry to tell LBJ that he was still treating Kennedy and the medications for Addison's created psychological problems such as a split personality and very neurotic behavioral patterns. In spite of the doctor not wanting to make a confirmation, Johnson decided to make the issue public, though avoided publicly mentioning it and instead resorted to John Connolly and India Edwards giving a press conference in which the latter said Kennedy had Addison's disease and that she had been told by doctors that JFK was only alive thanks to cortisone. Robert Kennedy responded to the claim by saying that his brother only had some adrenal insufficiency and any statement to the contrary is malicious and false despicable tactics a sure sign of the desperation of the opposition evidently there are those within the democratic party who would prefer that if they cannot win the nomination themselves they want the democrat who does win to lose in november johnson followed the advice of carmen de sapio and disavowed edward's statement on july 5th johnson stood in the senate office building and announced i am as of this moment a candidate for the office of president of the united states all the candidates had been invited to an NAACP rally, including Johnson, who declined attending and sent former Interior Secretary Chapman in his place. The audience, mostly blacks, were tough on each candidate except Humphrey, who was cheered when he came to speak. 
As soon as Chapman spoke and mentioned Johnson's name, the crowd shouted angrily and so long that it appeared Chapman would be unable to speak. Chapman was finally able to say that he would not support Johnson if he did not believe LBJ wholeheartedly back the Supreme Court decision on desegregation. Although the chance seemed minimal, there was a possibility that Kennedy would be unable to get those 761 he needed to secure the nomination should he not win almost all of Pennsylvania's votes. Governor David Lawrence had spent the past year trying to stop a Kennedy victory in his state. The morning after a 1959 Jefferson Jackson Day dinner, Lawrence met with Richard Daly, Robert Wagner, Carmen DeSapio, Mike DeSalle, and Pat Brown at a mass and Lawrence delivered a sermon that Kennedy just can't win. Districts that have always gone Democratic, I lost because I was a Catholic. The Kennedy West Virginia victory, which had erased the fears of many leaders that a Catholic could not win, did little to erase Lawrence's, who still thought he would lose Pennsylvania and drag Democrats in the state down with him. Lawrence also resented LBJ, believing a Southerner could not win either. Lawrence shifted after being given the full treatment, and Johnson spent the weekend trying to hold Pennsylvania delegates, partnered with President of the United Mine Workers, John L. Lewis, and UMW's Chief Counsel, Welly Hopkins. When he arrived in Los Angeles, Lawrence found that many of his Pennsylvania delegates were for JFK and saw how little support Stevenson had in Illinois when he was invited to Chicago by Mayor Daley. Against Lawrence's wishes, Stevenson refused to confirm that he was a candidate. In his suite at the Biltmore, Johnson received the exact count. Four of Pennsylvania's 81 votes went to Johnson, seven and a half for Stevenson and 64 for Kennedy. Roe remembered a voice beside him saying softly, I don't see how we can stop this fellow. The Kennedy campaign headquarters, seeking to get their candidate in front of as many delegates as possible, sent a letter to each chairman of each delegation requesting a chance to address problems and articulate his views. Johnson, in his capacity as the Texas delegation chairman, believed this was an opening to debate Kennedy that would change everything. He told Irv Hoff, I want to get on the same podium with Jack. I'll destroy him. Johnson drafted a reply which determined to elevate the event to a debate on major issues between the two leading presidential candidates in front of the Texas and Massachusetts delegations. Though Joseph Kennedy thought his son a damned fool if he were to accept, JFK consented. Philip Graham described Johnson's reaction as tremendous exhilaration, the latter seeing himself as a candidate for the presidency with a chance, even an unlikely one. When Kennedy rose to speak as Johnson attended the same event, Arthur Schlesinger saw Johnson's face change as Kennedy spoke, an opinion echoed by Texas delegates like Jim Wright, who had been eager disciples of the Senate Majority Leader. Irv Hoff later remembered, he got cured once and for all of getting into a debate with Jack Kennedy. Johnson watched Sam Rayburn's speech, the first nominating address of the convention from a television screen. Rayburn said, I am going to present you today a man that I have known since his babyhood. I knew his pioneer father and mother who faced the ravages of the Great West when there was little or no civilization there. Rayburn called LBJ a poor boy who dreamed great dreams. Johnson had a folded sheet with the delegate count on it, and it showed JFK just barely having enough delegates to secure the nomination on the first ballot. McCracken announced that Kennedy had secured all 15 votes from Wyoming. Kennedy finished the first ballot with 806 votes to Johnson's 409. And the other possibilities, which included Humphrey, Symington, Stevenson, and other various favorite sons, having a total of 306. Johnson told Reedy and Busby that he wanted a telegram sent to Kennedy pledging his full support and for copies to be sent to both the Western Union and the Kennedy people directly. Carroll writes, His chances to win his party's nomination in 1960 was gone now. And if in the general election Kennedy defeated the Republican nominee and served his full two terms, he might not get another chance until 1968. There was, of course, a possibility Kennedy might lose the Republican, that he would get another chance the nomination in 1964. But Kennedy, despite his loss, would be coming into the convention as the party's last standard bearer and would be even harder to beat than he had just been. It wasn't much of a possibility. Eight years would probably be how long Lyndon Johnson would have to wait. And eight years, Lyndon Johnson would be 60. And that was an age that throughout his life had loomed before him with a grim, talismanic significance. All during his boyhood, he had heard relatives repeating a piece of family lore that all Johnson men had weak hearts and died young. Then, while he was still in college, his father was barely 50 years old. Sam Ely's heart had begun to fail, and he had died in 1937. 12 days after his 60th birthday. Two years later, one of his father's two young brothers, 
Lyndon's uncle had died suddenly of a massive heart attack at the age of 57. Lyndon, always conscious of his remarkable physical resemblance to his tall, big-eared, big-nosed father, was convinced, convinced, one of his secretaries says, the point of obsession, that he had inherited the Johnson legacy. I'm not going to live to be but 60, he would say. My daddy died at 60, my uncle, with attempts to argue him out of disbelief. He had no patience. Once, when Lady Bird was trying to reassure him that he would not die young, he looked at her scornfully and said flatly, it's a lead pipe cinch. And then in 1955, at the age of 46, he had had his own massive heart attack. Now in 1960, with the nomination loss, he felt he couldn't wait eight years for another chance to win it. When following Kennedy's victory on Wednesday night, Reedy and Busby had been called into his suite. They had seen how depressed he was, and Reedy had tried to counsel him by pointing out that he would have another chance in eight years. There was a long pause before Lyndon Johnson's reply, and when it came, it came in a very low voice. Too long, he said. Too long. Johnson worried that if he won the presidential nomination but not the general election, he would be reduced to a footnote in history as another defeated presidential candidate. The last Southerner elected to the presidency, Zachary Taylor, in 1848, had taken office a century earlier, and now a Southern candidate would have to unite the 11 Southern states behind him, in addition to winning some of the Northeast states, California, and the Republican Midwest. Johnson did not think this possible, at one point admitting to a reporter that he believed no Southerner would be nominated for president during his lifetime, nor win. To quote Carroll, as long as he was Senate leader held responsible by civil rights militants and segregationist militants, by Northerners and Southerners and by the media, for the fate of civil rights and institution, he would not be able to escape being viewed as a sectional candidate from the wrong section. Lyndon Johnson's path to the presidency, that route he had mapped out for himself so long before, had always been narrow, twisting. He had navigated so many treacherous turns, had come much farther along the path than might have thought possible, but he could go no further. That route was closed. In early 1960, Johnson had his staffers look up how many vice presidents had become president. The 10, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Martin Van Buren, John Tyler, Millard Fillmore, Andrew Johnson, Chester A. Arthur, Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, and Harry Truman were relayed to Johnson. Carroll explains that while the vice presidency was seen as a meaningless position, a joke position when looked at, it was the position of a national figure and would allow Johnson to cut his ties to the Southern Bloc of the Senate so that when he did run for president after Kennedy's term ended, he would be seen as the natural heir rather than a sectional candidate. Johnson also had his staffers look up how many presidents had died in office and five had passed in 100 years before 1960, Abraham Lincoln in 1865. James Garfield in 1881, William McKinley in 1901, Warren Harding in 1923, and FDR in 1945, averaging a death every 20 years. Even in his retirement, Johnson continued to believe no Southerner would be elected president in the foreseeable future. When sitting next to former Congresswoman Clara Booth Luce on his way to the 1961 inaugural ball, the latter asked him why he had accepted the vice presidential nomination, LBJ replying, Claire, I looked it up. One out of every four presidents has died in office. I'm a gambler man, darling, and this is the only chance I got. After the West Virginia primary on May 10th, Johnson was asked if he would accept the vice presidential nomination, answering, that's a very iffy question. When and if my country wants me to serve her, I will give it every consideration. This was a notable change from his blatant rejections of such a possibility. In a private conversation between Ted Sorensen and Bobby Baker in June, the latter speculated that the ticket might be Kennedy and Johnson. Sorensen, admitting he viewed the ticket as wonderful, expressed doubts that Johnson would agree to it, and Baker told him not to be too sure. Later that month, Kennedy supporter Matt McCloskey suggested that Johnson would make a great team with Kennedy if LBJ took the second spot. Rayburn exploding. We didn't come down here to talk about the second spot. We came here to talk about the first spot. LBJ interjected, now wait a minute, Sam. I don't want these boys to go out of here and not know where I stand. First of all, I am a Democrat and I am going to do anything my party wants me to do. Johnson replied to a reporter's question about the vice presidency. Well, that is a very iffy question and I wouldn't want to have it even thought that I would refuse to serve my country in any capacity from running the elevator to the top job if I felt that my services were needed. Carroll explains that these signals were overlooked due to Johnson prior to the West Virginia primary stating that he would never consider the vice presidency and Kennedy campaign figures asserting that LBJ would never be offered the vice presidency. When Humphrey refused to endorse Kennedy and thus took himself out of contention for the VP spot, Senators Henry Scoop Jackson and Stuart Symington, as well as Governor Orville L. Freeman, were the most considered. 
Arthur Schlesinger recounted that Johnson's name was not only never mentioned, but that the Kennedy people told everybody as categorically as possible that he was not in the picture. With two hours before Kennedy would come to his suite, Johnson was unsure of what he would do. Bobby Baker, Jim Rowe, and John Connolly arrived, LBJ instructing the group to lay out the reasons for why he should either accept or decline to be Kennedy's running mate. The three concluded that Johnson had more to lose by declining the offer, Connolly telling Johnson that Kennedy would lose Texas to Nixon if LBJ was on the ticket. A Kennedy loss, they reasoned, would be blamed on Johnson by Northern liberals who already disliked the Southerner and felt he was not a fully committed Democrat. They also thought Kennedy himself would blame Johnson. The group felt that Johnson had less to risk being Kennedy's running mate with Baker saying, I don't think you have a thing in the world to lose by running with Kennedy. Connolly remembered telling Johnson, you'll still have the speaker, meaning that Rayburn being in his corner would prevent LBJ from having no power as vice president, and Kennedy would likely be unable to get around Rayburn when dealing with the House as president. Carroll writes, and then there was another possible upside, one that was in the minds of all three advisors, even though pragmatic and tough though they were. They mentioned it only in another oblique phrase, in part because, perhaps, they were not able to think about it other than obliquely, for thinking about another man's mortality often leads to thoughts of one's own mortality, and these are thoughts difficult to confront directly. Connolly told LBJ, I felt you're a heartbeat away from the presidency. Rowe, unable to use the same words, telephoned Johnson to say, on balance, I would take it. I want to see you president one day. Congressman Homer... Thornberry called Johnson to express condolences for his having lost the presidential nomination, to which Johnson mentioned the possibility of him being Kennedy's running mate. Although Thornberry initially objected to the idea, Johnson listed the reasons he had to accept the position so persuasively that Thornberry changed his mind. Rayburn, who had a close friendship with FDR's Vice President John Nance Gardner, saw his friend go back to Texas a bitter man for life, and was determined that the son he never had, Lyndon Johnson, would not suffer the same fate. The night before leaving for Los Angeles, Rayburn told friends, the first thing I'm going to do when I get off that plane tomorrow is to announce to the world that Lyndon Johnson ain't interested in second spot on a ticket with Kennedy. Johnson, knowing he could not accept the vice presidential slot without Rayburn's approval, telephoned Earl Clements after his conference with Connolly, Rowe, and Baker ended. Johnson congratulated Kennedy on becoming their party's nominee, and the latter asked Johnson if he were available for the vice presidency. Johnson replied that he was and recommended Kennedy discuss the matter with party leaders. They also briefly discussed Rayburn, who Johnson approved Kennedy directly speaking with to see if he could change his mind. The conversation between Kennedy and Johnson was vague enough for both to deny its contents, with Kennedy recalling they talked mostly about what happened last night. Johnson called Baker, Connolly, and Jenkins to tell them that Kennedy had offered him the vice presidency, and as JFK met with northern bosses, he told them that Johnson wanted some time to think it over, but looked as though he would accept it. Robert Kerr entered the Johnson suite, livid with rage, shouting at the Johnsons and Baker, Get me my 38! I'm gonna kill every damn one of you! I can't believe that my three best friends would betray me! Baker tried to calm Kerr down, but the latter slapped him across the face so hard that Baker describes literally seeing stars as Kerr screamed, Bobby, you betrayed me! You betrayed me! Kerr finally calmed after Baker explained the benefits to Johnson as vice president and hugged the Johnsons afterward. The syndicate columnist Charles Bartlett, a friend of the Kennedys, wrote that he was told Kennedy had made the offer to Johnson merely as a gesture and that the brothers were shocked when LBJ seized the offer and held fast to it. Carroll explains that accounts such as Barlitz are given weight by many historians because of Robert Kennedy's repeated and emphatic reiterations of them, and because of the acceptance of those reiterations as accurate, and the restatement of them in books and articles by Arthur Schlesinger, whose writings on John and Robert Kennedy have for decades set the template for the image of the two brothers in history. Carroll concludes that the accounts offered by both RFK's oral history and Schlesinger are not supported by a number of actions that John F. Kennedy actually took that day. The first action took place with Robert Kennedy asking how many electoral votes JFK would be able to get if they captured the East, Northeast, and the Solid South. The second action was when Kennedy telephoned Governor Lawrence to remind the latter of his pledge that Johnson would accept the vice presidential nomination if offered, and that Lawrence, who believed LBJ being on the ticket was necessary to win the Southern electoral votes essential for a victory, had come to reaffirm his guarantee in person. Lawrence O'Donnell met with JFK, who gave reasons for wanting LBJ on the ticket with him. This included replacing Johnson with Mike Mansfield as Senate Majority Leader, keeping LBJ and Sam Rayburn happy so they could pass liberal legislation in the new Congress, and the vice presidency not meaning anything because 
JFK was the healthiest candidate for president of the United States and thus not going to die in office. Johnson sent emissaries such as Clements, Homer Thornberry, and Wright Patman to smooth Rayburn over with Patman recalling Sam was in the bathroom in his shorts and he was shaving. He was blistering mad about Lyndon's even considering the vice presidency. JFK met with Rayburn and the latter gave conditions on which he would support LBJ as the running mate for Kennedy if the latter agreed to them. This included Kennedy telling Rayburn that he needed Johnson to win the election, that he would go before the world and tell the world that Johnson's selection was his choice and that he would use LBJ in the National Security Council and every other way to keep him busy and keep him happy. Kennedy agreed to these conditions. After the Rayburn-Kennedy meeting, Rayburn told Johnson, I don't like it, but I don't think you do have any choice. Though Johnson, Rayburn, and Connolly were to assume everything was settled, Carol writes, and then Connolly was to say, Bobby Kennedy showed up and said he wanted to see Mr. Johnson. And from that moment, and for approximately the next three hours, nothing was settled. And during those hours, what had previously remained, despite all the tension within the boundaries of normal political behavior, was transformed with the admixture of personal hatred into confusion of chaos, a chaos whose aftermath would, during the next eight years, affect profoundly the shape of American politics, and to a lesser but still surprisingly significant degree, the shape of American history. Carroll furthers that no two people of those involved can agree on anything that happened during those hours, and quotes Theodore White, it is a trap of history to believe that eyewitnesses remember accurately what they have lived through. Rayburn and Connolly met with RFK in LBJ's place, as the latter stated his disinterest in seeing the younger Kennedy brother. RFK communicated that JFK offering the vice presidency to Johnson was a terrible mistake that would likely result in a convention fight from liberals and labor figures, and wondered if Johnson would sell for being DNC chair. Rayburn left the room to meet with Johnson and relayed to RFK that Johnson would accept the nomination, but only if JFK drafted him. Graham telephoned JFK, who after a second phone call told him, it's all set. Tell Lyndon I want him and we'll have Lawrence nominate him, etc. In a third meeting, RFK told Connolly that he needed to convince Johnson to withdraw on his own, but the latter restated Rayburn's position that JFK would need to withdraw the offer after being the one who made it. JFK called Johnson afterward, reading a press release on selecting LBJ as his running mate. Johnson asked Kennedy if he really wanted him, and after Kennedy replied in the affirmative, Johnson said, well, if you really want me, I'll do it. Though it was thought the matter was settled, Johnson aide Bill Moyers ran to Graham and Rowe to announce RFK was there meeting with LBJ. Johnson claimed RFK let all his hatred and contempt for him spill out. Johnson was then alone with Lady Bird, Rayburn, Connolly, Graham, Rowe, and Baker, with Graham recalling that LBJ seemed about to jump out of his skin, as the latter told the group that he had been informed by RFK that JFK doesn't want me. Under Rayburn's order, Graham telephoned JFK, who insisted that RFK was out of touch, and that he wanted LBJ to make a statement. The Johnsons were pushed into the press corps. Outside their corridors were according to Graham as they rose, their faces metamorphosed into enthusiasm and confidence. Carol ponders if RFK was trying to get LBJ off the ticket without JFK's knowledge. Philip Graham, who wrote a memorandum shortly after the convention, found it hard to determine if this was the case. Although Bobby denied this claim when Graham's memorandum was published in both 1965 and 1967, his oral interviews with Arthur Schlesinger and John Bartlow Martin indicate that JFK and RFK had, in reference to LBJ, decided not to have him, and we came upon this idea offering him the DNC chairmanship of trying to get rid of him, and it didn't work. Carroll writes that descriptions of the telephone conversations support the view that Robert Kennedy was acting on his own without his brother's knowledge. RFK explained that JFK had not yet made a public statement and still wanted LBJ off the ticket at the time RFK was first dispatched by his brother to make the offer, furthering that the decision to publicly announce Johnson's choice was made between the time RFK went to see Johnson and the time he returned to JFK's suite, and this decision had been made because someone called JFK and told him he needed to make an announcement. After accepting JFK's decision, RFK and Ken O'Donnell went to UAW President Walter Ruther's sweet to meet labor and liberal leaders. These men, who had been assured Johnson would not be Kennedy's running mate, were violently angry. President of the Cloth, Hat, Cap, and Mulaney Workers International Union, Alex Rose, shouted that if LBJ was on a ticket with JFK, the latter would not receive the Liberal Party designation in New York. As O'Donnell was to relate, I don't think that Bobby Kennedy fully realized the predicament that Jack had put us in to, until we walked into the room at the Statler Hilton. Carroll explains that while the scene at the Statler Hilton may have been emotional, 
it doesn't explain Bobby's repeated attempts, attested to not only by Johnson but by Rayburn and Connolly, to persuade Johnson to withdraw from the ticket. O'Donnell remembered that RFK asked JFK if he wanted him to relate to Johnson that a floor fight may break out if he was chosen as the nominee. The older Kennedy telling RFK, maybe you better go downstairs and tell him that. I doubt that it will bother him, but we ought to let him know that there might be a floor fight against him in case he doesn't feel up to facing it. Graham telephoned JFK during the latter's meeting with liberals, and the presidential nominee said, It's all set. Tell Lyndon I want him. Around this time, RFK and LBJ concluded their private meeting, during which Johnson claimed he was told by RFK that his brother did not want him. JFK told Graham in a subsequent call that Bobby's been out of touch, and instructed LBJ to make a statement announcing his acceptance of nomination immediately. Carroll writes, Robert Kennedy could, of course, have been doing what he thought his brother wanted him to do, but didn't want to put into words, even to him, or he could have been hearing, hearing through the haze of his hatred for Johnson, what he wanted to hear. Carroll speculates that JFK may have allowed promises and assurances to be given in his name to both liberals and labor leaders that Johnson would not be his running mate, and the only explanation was that he held out the running mate slot to LBJ like this, and that the latter had to Kennedy's shot grabbed at it, and JFK had no alternative to letting the offer stand. Carroll writes, Since rumors and reports of rumors, confusion and conflicting stories, are a staple of all contested political conventions, the questions surrounding Lyndon Johnson's acceptance of John F. Kennedy's offer to be his vice president, and Kennedy's decision to make or not to make the offer to him, might not warrant as much consideration, so much effort to resolve them, as they have for decades been given except that, because of November 22, 1963, the events of that long afternoon in 1960 were to affect so profoundly the course of American history. As Evans and Novak were to write, the alliance between John Kennedy and Johnson that opened to Johnson the door of national power set in motion the mutual suspicion between Johnson and Robert Kennedy that would grow in importance and depth as the years went by. After that afternoon, Robert Kennedy wasn't the only one of the two men who hated the other. Whatever Lyndon Johnson's feelings towards Robert Kennedy had been before, the events of that afternoon had intensified them. He never blamed Jack Kennedy for the uncertainties and indignities, and he attempted to destroy his hopes to snatch away from him the opportunity he so much wanted that were visited upon him that afternoon. Reporters greeted Kennedy's announcement with gasp. O'Donnell was informed the Michigan delegation was intending to nominate a candidate to oppose Johnson, not with the purpose that this would defeat LBJ, but more so succeed in embarrassing JFK. Chairman of the District of Columbia delegation Robert Nathan announced Minnesota Governor Orville Freeman as the candidate and commentators noted the opposition to JFK's running mate was spreading, with veteran Edward R. Murrow expressing that Kennedy would have to directly put the issue down himself instead of his managers or lieutenants. Johnson had a run-in with reporter Bill Downs, who in reference to Johnson having wanted to be the presidential nominee, remarked, Senator, this is the first time you've been out to the arena. We expected you to come in a different role. Economist John Kenneth Galbraith began telling liberal delegates that the move was not unprecedented, reminding them of FDR picking John Nance Garner as his running mate in 1932. Galbraith pleading, for God's sakes, give Kennedy the same right that you would have automatically given FDR. Joseph Kennedy told his son that in two weeks, they'll be saying it's the smartest thing you ever did. The Washington Post noted the tradition that the convention does not deny a presidential candidate the right to pick his running mate. United Steel Workers of America member David McDonald remarking, if Jack wants Lyndon, I'm for Lyndon. Orville Freeman, though admitting he was not enthusiastic about Johnson as Kennedy's running mate, nevertheless told the District of Columbia delegates not to nominate him. Carroll writes, As 8 o'clock neared and the hopelessness of opposing Kennedy's choice became apparent, the district's delegation and some liberal delegates and other delegations remained determined, even if they did not nominate other candidates, to withhold their votes from Johnson, but in fact they were unable to register even in this form of protest, because Sam Rayburn knew how to make sure they wouldn't be able to. After Johnson had been nominated by Governor Lawrence and seconded and Vance had played the Eyes of Texas and the Yellow Rose of Texas, while delegates paraded through the hall in his honor, it was noticeable that few northern delegates got out of their seats, but the southern delegates, including those who had not joined the parade for Kennedy, marched in strength. Rayburn's majority leader in the House, John W. McCormick, made a motion to suspend the convention rules which allowed other nominations and nominate Johnson by acclamation. 
Explaining that such a motion required approval of two-thirds of delegates, Chairman Collins called for a voice vote. Estimates of whether there were more A's or nays were to vary from newspaper to newspaper. In the opinion of most, they were about evenly divided, and Collins hesitated as a rising murmur began in the Coliseum, during which the harsh, commanding voice of a bald old man in the Texas delegation could be heard shouting, Say A! Say A! And Rayburn's man on the platform, the convention's parliamentarian, Representative Clarence Cannon of Missouri, whispered something in Collins' ear, and Collins announced that the rules had been suspended and that Lyndon Johnson has been nominated for vice president by acclaim. While the parade in his honor had been going on, Johnson and Lady Bird had come out of the modal home at the head of his honorage to walk the few yards to the Coliseum. As he emerged, Ed Murrow said to Walter Cronkite, Johnson looks considerably older than when he arrived here, doesn't he, Walter? Shows the strain. He certainly does, Cronkite replied. He looks exceedingly tired, and I would say somewhat downcast. But while he waited behind the podium, the bands playing his songs, Chairman Collins announced that he was, by acclamation, a Democratic nominee for vice president, and then he came out on the high platform above the crowd, and his smile broadened into a big smile, and he threw up his long arms in the V for victory sign. Kennedy and Johnson opened their post-convention campaign by appearing together in Boston on Labor Day and later in Texas cities, thereafter waging separate campaigns that saw a minimum of either interaction or friction between the Kennedy and Johnson camps. Johnson was tasked to hold the South, or rather given Eisenhower's win of five of the 11 states the Confederacy, win it back. Johnson warned Florida leaders that Kennedy was going to win, and that a victory without the South would mean the latter's administration would do nothing for the region. Johnson's campaign included a train that tore down the South in a 13-car LBJ special, composed of two locomotives chugging one of Washington's Union Station to spend several days going through the little towns and cities of eight southern states. Johnson's talks were brief but southern in their message, LBJ asking at one stop, Why, oh why, should the great state of Virginia ever vote Republican? This high-talking, high-spending crowd has never done anything for the South. It has no interest in Virginia or any other southern state. What excuse have you got for not voting with the party of your fathers? Carroll writes, and some of the points he made were unforgettable. For if Lyndon Johnson reading from a prepared speech was stilted and unconvincing, Lyndon Johnson without a speech, Lyndon Johnson alone with an audience he had to persuade, was still the Lyndon Johnson who had, in his early Texas campaigns, shown that in a state with a history of great stump speakers, he was one of the greatest of them all. The issue of Kennedy's Catholicism came up, Johnson addressing it in his own way. LBJ would begin by stating that the hate campaign against JFK was a shame, especially from Baptist preachers. Kennedy had an older brother, Joe Jr., who he loved and who was dead now. He had been killed in the war, volunteering to pilot a plane on a suicide mission. And when Jack's brother left that morning for a mission he knew he would not come back from, nobody asked him what church he went to. As Johnson told the story of Kennedy's brother, his voice would waver and almost break, with a deep hush falling over the crowd gathered across the train platform in each town. Johnson was also interviewed by Walter Cronkite on September 26. Why would a man who loves these hills and has this magnificent ranch and this vista you've got right here on the river want to uh, ever take the time out to fight these hard and difficult battles in a distant and remote Washington, D.C. Oh, Walter, uh, I think that we enjoy the time that we spend here, but uh, all of my life uh, I have wanted to be a public servant. Uh, my father ahead of me was, and I grew up uh, wanting to help people with their problems, and I get a satisfaction and a sense of achievement from uh, constructive efforts on behalf of human beings that uh, you can't get in all, most any other profession. Uh, I will have been in Washington 30 years uh, come next year, and uh, I think I'd just be lost if uh, I didn't uh, work uh, in some public field. If I couldn't uh, be in public life, I would want to be uh, a teacher as I was before I entered the public life because uh, uh, I could have an influence on the minds of the young people and lead them in the, the directions that uh, I would like to see them go. I've often said that if I'd had a boy, I'd want him to be either a politician or a preacher or a teacher because 
they would have a sense of achievement that comes uh, uh, from a few other uh, professions. Well, now, it took you a little while to find this way of your life. Uh, you, here at the ranch, uh, you wanted to get away early in life. You, you went away as a laborer before uh, your disappointed father succeeded in getting you back and into teacher's college. Uh, why did you want to leave in the first place? Well, uh, Walter, I didn't want to leave. It was uh, more of a necessity. I worked all my life. Uh, as a little boy, I shined shoes at the barber shop. Uh, I was a printer's devil. I ran off uh, the weekly paper on Thursday afternoon, the old Washington Press. I inked it. Uh, that's Washington, when I Texas Press. Uh, when I, uh, that's the name of the press. Uh, when I uh, graduated from high school at 15, I wanted a job, and there were not any jobs to be had around here in 1924, so I took the old philosopher's advice, Horace Greeley, and went west, young man, and worked two years in California in the flat building as an elevator boy in San Bernardino, and finally wound up in the lawyer's office. But I came back, and mother uh, talked me into going to college, and uh, during the period I was in college, I taught a Latin American school down in South Texas, and it gave me great satisfaction, and I thought I wanted to be a teacher. So when I finished college, I went to Houston and taught a year, and then the great opportunity of my life uh, came to me when Congressman Clayburg, one of the owners of the King Ranch, asked me to go to Washington as his secretary in the Hoover administration, 1931. And uh, except for a brief period of 15 months, I've been in Washington ever since, 12 years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, five years there as a secretary. Had you given any thought to a political career before that appointment to go to Washington? Yes. Uh, I assume ever since uh, uh, they first told me of Grandpa's uh, uh, prediction, uh, I had an ambition to be a United States Senator. And uh, I took the steps that I thought were calculated to prepare me for that work and to make it possible for me to be elected. I was first elected to Congress when I was 28 in 1937. In 1941, Senator Shepard died, and I ran to succeed him. I was defeated in a very close race by the then governor of the state, uh, W. Leo Daniel. He defeated me in 1941 by 1,311 votes out of more than a million. And then I waited until 1948, and when Governor the then Senator O'Daniel decided not to run. I ran uh, for that place and had a, a very close race, but was elected in November and have been in the Senate since that time. Well, that loss to uh, W. Leo O'Daniel must have been a rather bitter one for you, your first uh, major state race. Did you, uh, what did you ascribe your loss to then? No, it wasn't bitter. Uh, I think that uh, Governor O'Daniel was a very popular public figure at the time and I was a very young man and had, uh, was unknown uh, throughout the state. I'd represented a, a district in Central Texas, and uh, I, I, was rather, I ran rather surprisingly well uh, with the, uh, at that age and with the resources at my command. Your technique of leadership is considerably different. Uh, if I may, I'd like to quote uh, uh, from a chap here who one observer has quoted one of your biographies. Being won over by Johnson is a rather overwhelming experience. The full treatment is an incredibly potent mixture of persuasion, badgering, flattery, threats, reminders of past favors and future advantages. Well, that's a, 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 a technique for leadership, obviously. Uh, how does this... I would, say, I would say that uh, uh, the fellow was more interested in his sentence structure than he was accuracy. Uh, <laughs> You don't uh, deal with senators really that way. Uh, I think the only thing uh, that uh, uh, is calculated to appeal to members of the Senate is uh, a presentation of the facts and the soundness of your logic. Uh, nearly every senator that uh, takes the oath of office uh, is elected on a platform of doing what's right. And uh, your problem as leader is to convince him that uh, the cause you represent is the right cause. Now, uh, uh, there are not any favors that you can do for a senator that you remind him of. Uh, there's no cajolery or flattery involved. Uh, 
that doesn't appeal to a man that's uh, capable and worthy of representing uh, one of the great states in the Union. Uh, they're not schoolboys. Uh, even though some of these fellows that uh, write these things sometimes uh, uh, make them sound uh, that way. Uh, I would say that uh, I try to follow the old prophet Isaiah's advice, come let us reason together. And uh, that course of action uh, always appeals to reasonable men. And most senators are reasonable. Uh, uh, Republicans sometimes uh, a little more difficult for us Democrats to reason with than the members of our own party. But uh, all of them are patriotic uh, uh, members of the Senate, and they want to do what's best for their country. And uh, once they're convinced that the course of action that you present is for the best interests of America, uh, you'll usually have a lopsided vote in your favor. Senator, uh, since you were a protege, in a sense, of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's in, in those early days of the New Deal with your NYA administration here, uh, you were identified with the more liberal element of the Democratic Party in those days. And I think in recent years, the identification has been more toward the conservative side. Is, is this a kind of the normal development of a man, do you feel, toward the liberal to the conservative? And is this a tendency that's likely to continue in your own life, do you feel? Or? Well, I presume that we all become a little more prudent uh, as we uh, grow older. Although I've never been much of a believer in uh, labels, uh, I'm a great admirer of President Roosevelt's now, just as I was then. Uh, he hasn't changed, uh, uh, in my viewpoint, any. And uh, as I engage in a little introspection, I haven't changed much. Uh, uh, my philosophy is that I'm a, a free man first, and an American second, United States Senator third, and a Democrat fourth, in that order. Now, I am a member of the Democratic Party because I think that uh, through the vehicle of that party, I can best uh, see my philosophy translated into action. I believe my party cares more uh, about the problems uh, of the people of this country and is more concerned with helping them with their problems than the Republican Party. And for that reason, I'm a Democrat. But uh, uh, I am a a free man and an American and a senator first. Senator, uh, uh, I don't go in much for the labels of liberal and conservative. Uh, I think you can be a progressive uh, senator and still be a prudent senator. I don't think you have to be a wastrel. I think we've demonstrated that in the Democratic Party by cutting $12.5 billion uh, from the president's uh, budget requests. I think you can be a conservative uh, senator without being a reactionary senator. Uh, but labels don't mean much to me. What I'm interested in is, is this piece of legislation or is this uh, uh, project or is this program good for my country? Is it the right thing to do? And if it's good for my country, it's good for my party and consequently good for me. Senator, uh, uh, the darkest day, I guess, in your, uh, in your life uh, came in 1955 when you had the heart attack, which we all know about. But I'm wondering how that... Uh, experience affected your philosophy. I, I know that there are some who we, our researchers, have talked to in the uh, Senate to uh, said that uh, before that they sort of felt you were a brash young politician, but after that they felt you became the politician's politician, that this was a turning point in a way. Do you feel that yourself at all? No, I don't think it had any uh, appreciable effect on the course of my conduct at all. I think uh, during the period of 60 days when I was uh, uh, away from the Senate chamber that uh, I had time to reflect and uh, really appreciate all the good people that I'd known and uh, how unworthy perhaps I had been of uh, their devotion and their friendship. Uh, I know that uh, I never really recognized the fact that uh, uh, the senators could be as good men as they demonstrated to me they were. Uh, I remember Senator Nolan wrote me nearly every day that I was in the hospital, and I had uh, communications from every member of the Senate except one. Uh, a good many of them came to see me nearly every day, and uh, it was their interest and their prayers, I think, that sustained me during that period uh, when uh, I was somewhat distressed. But uh, after the initial two months, and I came back here to the ranch, uh, I haven't observed that it's affected my conduct of public business uh, at all.
As a matter of fact, uh, I sometimes amused when I think of the letter I received from President Eisenhower uh, telling me that he had read in the papers of my activity and he thought I was uh, uh, going to work a little too fast and he hoped I'd slow down. And that letter was sent to me without a signature by General Person. General Person said that it was the last letter dictated by the president the night before he had his heart attack. And he was lecturing me on slowing down a little bit uh, just before he had his. Eugene Patterson of the Atlantic Constitution wrote, What he was doing was speaking the language. He was likable. He was folksy, earthy. It was clear what his job is. To speak to the people in their own tongue while Kennedy addresses his broad A to the ages. Kennedy looks gone the white horse. Johnson dominates the caboose. The parlor car was filled with southern politicians that constantly changed. As soon as Johnson finished his speech in the town, he and his wife would go back to the parlor car to have their photo taken with officials, and this was followed by Johnson chatting with them, charming them, and warning them about the South's fate if Nixon won or if Kennedy won without the South's support. In the five days of the LBJ special chugging along the Southland, 1,247 dignitaries, governors, senators, congressmen, state legislators, mayor, councilmen, sheriffs, bankers, businessmen, and other important figures of local communities were entertained in the parlor car. As the tour reached its conclusion, the initially skeptical McGrory wrote LBJ has justified his existence on the Democratic ticket. Another observer said, Master of the political coup has done it again. Carroll argues that holding Texas after Eisenhower's victory was probably LBJ's hardest job. State conservatives viewing him negatively for joining the Kennedy ticket and thereby running on the liberal Democratic platform. Jim Rowe remembered the ever-haunting fear of losing Texas never left him for a second. He was wound up tight like a top. On November 4th, days before the election, Johnson and Lady Bird arrived in Dallas to attend a Democratic rally in the Adolphus Hotel. Prior to the fundraiser, there had been a Republican event in the same hotel, with many of its attendees being women who were both Dallas junior leaguers and wearing Nixon costumes. This group crowded into the hotel's lobby and joined a group of men who had been organized by the state's sole Republican congressman, Bruce Auger. As the Johnsons entered the lobby, the group swarmed them with shouting and cursing, with one woman grabbing the gloves out of Lady Bird's hand and throwing them to the floor. LBJ told the Dallas policeman to stand aside instead of escorting them, and it took about 30 minutes for the couple to get from the hotel's front door to the elevators that took them to the ballroom. Rayburn aide and Johnson admirer D.B. Hardman remembered, LBJ and Lady Bird could have gone through the lobby and gone the elevator in five minutes, but LBJ took 30 minutes to go through that crowd and it was all being recorded and played for television and radio and the newspapers and he knew it and played it for all it was worth. The incident turned the tide in Texas with editorials echoing the Abilene Reporter news that the Dallas mob wrote a new chapter that stands to the shame of our state and people of whatever political shade. When the Johnson's plane arrived in Houston, well-wishers held signs reading, we apologize, we love you. The Johnsons were also greeted with standing ovations everywhere they went in Texas for the remaining time before the election. The Kennedy-Johnson ticket carried Texas with 1,167,932 votes to, to 1,121,699 votes. By the evening of the election, reporters noticed slow motion count of votes in Duval and knew that Parr was holding back a final tally until he could determine the election was close and then give his allies the votes they needed. Duval County voted for Kennedy Johnson 3,803 to 808, and Starr County saw the Kennedy Johnson ticket win with 4,051 to 284. The results were heavily in favor of the Kennedy Johnson ticket in counties controlled by Parr allies, with Webb County being won 10,059 to 1,802, Jim Haw County in 1,255 to 244, and Brooks 1,934 to 540. The nine counties controlled by Parr and his friends equated to 37,063 votes to the Texas Election Bureau, and almost 79% of them were for Kennedy Johnson. Carroll notes that Attention focused to voter fraud in the 1960 presidential election has centered on Illinois instead of Texas and concludes, whatever the explanation for the results from the ethnic bloc in Texas, John Kennedy had selected Lyndon Johnson in part to take back Texas for the Democratic presidential ticket, and Johnson had done it.
Prior to Johnson's nomination, Republican strategists were confident Nixon could hold the five southern states won by Eisenhower and win North and South Carolina as well. Instead, Kennedy won seven southern states to Nixon's three, and Carroll notes there were southwestern and border states in which Johnson's presence on the ticket may have been pivotal, with Clinton Anderson admitting that New Mexico would have gone Republican without Johnson. Carroll writes, on election night from Austin, Johnson made a call to Jack Kennedy. I am carrying Texas, he said. I hear you are losing Ohio and we are doing fine in Pennsylvania. Kennedy turned away from the phone with a smile. We? It was he who was going to be president. Lyndon Johnson was going to be vice president.